Hola, hola, bienvenidos todos. Mi nombre es Alexia, estoy aquí con mi compañera Yaya y somos parte de su equipo de Justicia del Lenguaje. Estamos aquí como intérpretes en el inglés y el español. Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. My name is Alexia and I'm here with my partner, Yaya. We are here today as your language justice team and we'll be your Spanish English interpreters. Eh, la justicia del lenguaje incluye el compromiso de la presencia plena de todos, eh, la capacidad de comunicarnos en nuestros idiomas. Language justice includes a commitment to everyone's full presence and capacity to communicate in our languages. Entonces queremos reconocer todos los idiomas presentes en el espacio, eh, también los idiomas de los pueblos indígenas de esta tierra. Eh, Yaya y yo, por ejemplo, estamos en la tierra de la gente y del idioma Tongva, tierra Tongva no cedida. I want to acknowledge all the languages here today, as well as the languages of the indigenous people of this land. Yaya and I are in Los Angeles, on unceded Tongva land. Eh, a veces la justicia del lenguaje también se manifiesta con todo el mundo participando en el mismo eh, espacio, usando las herramientas y prácticas de comun comunicación equitativa, y a veces como en el espacio de hoy se manifiesta eh, cuando la presentación se hace principalmente en un idioma, mientras les intérpretes trabajamos para incluir a las personas que usan otros idiomas, en este caso el día de hoy, el español y el lenguaje norteamericano de señas. Um, sometimes language justice looks like everyone participating in the same space using the tools and practices of equitable communication. And sometimes, as at today's event, it looks like a presentation happening primarily in one language, while interpreters work to include folks who use other languages, such as Spanish and ASL. Entonces, hoy las personas que prefieran accesar eh, la información en español pueden llamar a la línea de teléfono que es 609-663-1611. La voy a repetir de nuevo. Eh, la línea de español es la 609-663-1611. Today, for people who prefer to participate in Spanish, you can call a separate phone line, which is 609-663-1611. I'm going to repeat it again. The phone line is 609-663-1611. Y nada más un breve recordatorio para las personas que se conecten, por favor mantengan su micrófono silenciado para poder minimizar el ruido de fondo. Just a small reminder for those that connect to the phone line, please mute yourself when you're there to minimize background noise. Eh, muchas gracias al Centro de Educación Política y a Haymarket Books por hacer posible que podamos estar, ahí al Highlander Center también, que lo queremos mucho, por estar aquí en solidaridad con los esfuerzos multilingües y oficialmente les podemos pasar el micrófono de vuelta a los presentadores. Gracias. Thank you to the Center for Political Education, Haymarket Books, and... Um... The Highlander. The Highlanders uh, that we love so much. Thank you for making it possible for us to be here in solidarity with your multilingual efforts. The event can officially begin now. And third, if you're in a position
Good morning, good afternoon, whatever greeting works for the time zone you're in. It, you're in. My name is Ejeris Dixon, and I want to welcome you to What's Left, Building Power After the Elections. I'm so incredibly grateful to the Center for Political Education and for Haymarket Books to inviting all of us here to really discuss like electoral organizing and also power building among the left and what it looks like um, and, and, and how we build stronger movements. I also wanna thank the ASL interpreters, the live captioners and the Spanish English interpreters. Um, so again, I'm Ejeris Dixon. I'm a longtime organizer, activist, movement strategist, and the occasional writer. Um, I've been living at the intersection of racial justice, economic justice, and transformative justice movements. I'm the founding director of Vision Change When Consulting, where I support movement organizations to strengthen their strategy. Um, I'm an organizer who started building my work in, from the late 90s. I'm the author of Get Information, a movement security toolkit. I'm the co-editor of Beyond Survival, Stories and Strategies of Transformative Justice Movements. So as Alicia is so incredibly named in, in her keynote, we're at a really particular time. The coronavirus pandemic, climate crisis, state violence against Black people, violence against Black trans women, the separation of migrant families at the US-Mexico border, the oppression and deportation of migrant communities, and a rise in a global fascist and authoritarian movement. In the US and around the world, marginalized and oppressed communities are increasingly precarious and need support. Over the last few years, many left organizers built bigger, deeper electoral strategies as a way to expand their power building work and to push back against the right. And movements in the US have a lot to learn from radical movements outside of the US, including the recent triumph of Bolivian socialists over the US backed coup. And we're lucky to have Bolivian journalist, Ali Vargas, to share what was behind that one and what we can learn. Also recognizing in progressive spaces, there's been a lot of complex and sometimes heated discussion around whether building electoral power is fully in alignment with liberatory and revolutionary goals, whether this detracts from other forms of organizing outside the system, and what does democracy even mean? There have been some decisive victories, however, that have been only possible with the invaluable and instrumental support from leftist organizers, including um, the, including the win of defeating Trump. So we're left to think about what's next, what's needed, and what continues to build the power of oppressed and marginalized communities. We're here to get into the juicy questions of how organizers on the ground are holding the current dire and immediate needs of Black, Indigenous, people of color, low-income and no-income communities, working-class communities, and all of our liberatory visions. So as a lover of complexity, I come to you as a humble steward of a generative conversation. Some folks call electoral organizing a necessary power building move that navigates deep contradictions. Others call this work inherently compromised. Therefore, our, our, our goal today is to dig into the question, what is the role of electoral organizing within revolutionary change? And we've got some geniuses that are gonna enlighten and help us puzzle through this question. Our, um, the first person I'd like to speak to is Justin Charles, who is an interaction designer, educator, and rank and file union member. He organizes with the DSA as a member of its national political committee, New York City DSA, Afro Socialist, and Socialists of Color Caucus, and Emerge Caucus. Ashley Woodard Henderson is a 35 year old Afro Latin, Black Appalachian woman from the working class, born and raised in Southeast Tennessee. She is the first black woman to serve as the co-executive director of the Highlander Research and Education Center in Newmarket, Tennessee. As a member of multiple leadership teams in the Movement for Black Lives and for BL, Ashley has thrown down on the vision for black lives and the Breathe Act. Ash has served on the governance committee of the Southern, Southern Movement Assembly, the advisory committee of the National Bailout Collective, and is an active leader of the front line. Ali Vargas is a Bolivian reporter covering the situation in the country following the US backed coup in November of 2019. 
He is currently a reporter for Radio Tausachin Coca, which is in service of Bolivia's social movements and is the official outlet of the six federations of the tropical Bolivia Chapare unions. Oli's work can be found at Mint Press News, The Gray Zone, and Telesur English. So the question I want to start with for so many of y'all is all of you come from movements that have been experimenting with the combination of electoral strategies and mass organizing as a way of building power in the face of authoritarianism. And what are some of the concrete ways power was built for your communities during this past election cycle? And how can we use what was built as a springboard for greater and more enduring gains? Justin, I'd like to start with you to really also dig into the DSA's success of winning races and legislation at the local and state levels and what it means for your long-term strategy. Uh, thanks, Ajaris, and thank you to Haymarket uh, Books and the Center for, for Political Education and to our accessibility team. Um, so, you know, to, to, to answer your question, um, we had a very successful electoral cycle for Democratic Socialist America uh, this past November. Um, we ended up with a 73% win rate um, for our endorsed candidates and ballot measures. Um, so that amounts to us now having 155 elected officials representing our vision in 32 states. Um, there will be a $15 minimum wage in Florida. Um, free pre-K in Portland, uh, no evictions without representation in Boulder, uh, tenant protections, bans on facial surveillance, uh, local Green, Green New Deal initiatives in Maine. Um, there will also be four DSA members in Congress, uh, multiple state legislatures in Massachusetts, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, New York, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Maryland, Minnesota, Hawaii, Montana, uh, and Michigan. Uh, and we did all that in spite of, you know, a very bad electoral system that, you know, is, is you know, I guess basically against any kind of working class uh, organization or power. Um, we also celebrate, and, you know, this isn't our win exactly, but we do we do celebrate the win in Bolivia and around the world. Uh, we're, we're working class and, and, and left, uh, left power has been built. Um, and it's an example of how collective power um, is so central um, and a reminder that our struggle is not just here in the United States for DSA, but it's, it's international. Um, all that said, you know, winning elections is not the end in itself. Um, when these people get into office, it's important that they uh, are accountable to a, to a program that uh, empowers working class type people, empowers uh, black people, uh, indigenous people, and people of color. Um, I think also, you know, in, in DSA, I mean, people, what gets a lot of attention for, for us is our electoral success, but we don't do it just to win elections. We do it to build power for, for the class overall. Um, and as you mentioned, when you open the Jarris, there's, you know, we're in the midst of a pandemic, we're in the midst of an economic crisis. Um, the next big thing on our plate uh, is, you know, today, actually, we have a day of action going on nationally, uh, uh, our fight for our lives, um, which is kind of spearheaded by our eco-socialist working group. Um, but it's calling for, um, it's demanding that Congress passes a, a people's bailout. <laughs> First of all, um, it's demanding uh, the funding of a green stimulus. Um, Congress enact a federal jobs guarantee that they pass the PRO Act to protect workers uh, and pass the Health Care Emergency Guarantee Act. Um, the fact that, you know, Trump and, uh, you know, Biden will be the president doesn't mean that, you know, by no means mean the fight is over. It means the fight is just, you know, perhaps a little bit different in some ways it might be the same. Um, we have to make sure that the Congress, you know, doesn't capitulate, you know, to efforts to not support Americans in, in their time of crisis. Um, and that's something that DSA is going to be fighting for. Um, 
we're also very focused on, I think the left in general should be also very focused on um, the importance of building organization right now. Um, we have to continue to build up because uh, it's the only weapon we have is our organization as, 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 as a class. Um, so one of the big things that's been going on alongside the campaign and after um, is we had our we have our 100k uh, drive. Is basically we want to have we want to build up to 100 100,000 members for DSA um, through the course of the the drive. You know through the campaign and a little bit after we we managed to get up to uh, I believe now we're 87,000. But at the end of the drive was 85,000 members. Um, so. All that said is we want to build up our membership so that we can, you know, after these elections, you know, that's done. But we want to be able to work on the things like we like I just talked about with our eco-socialist working groups fight for our lives, uh, making sure that, you know, Congress um, is actually going to do what's right for Americans, do what's right for working people. Um, Aside from that, though, you know, me personally living in New York City, you know, one of the things that we we really got into over the summer with the uprisings uh, was 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 our defund the police campaign, defund the NYPD campaign, and that's going to be a big thing for us as it relates to electoral politics. Because in New York City in 2021, 35 uh, city council seats will be turning over, uh, will be open um, because of term limits. Um, and because of a very bad budget that got passed in the midst of the uprising um, that, you know, continue to fund the Ninman YPD, you know, to an exorbitant rate, most overfunded police department in the country. Um, a big thing for us is going to be focusing on how do we limit police budgets going forward. Um, but I'm, I'll get more into that as we get into the discussion. So I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. So, Ash. Same question, really, how are you experimenting with electoral store strategies and mass organizing? And particularly the Movement for Black Ma Lives has really invested in mobilizing black voters and also doing some work, some united front work with the front line, with the rising majority. How does electoral organizing connect to larger strategy for you all? Awesome, thanks for this question, Ajaris. And Thanks so much for the team who is making this call possible. It's an honor and a privilege to be amongst you. Um, so I think we, we have a lot of lessons that we're learning as we develop this multi-tactical strategy. But, but one of the, the biggest things that I feel like is a lesson uh, from the movement for Black Lives from the front line is that we are stronger together. And now is the time to build the biggest we. I would argue that if any any organizer, any activist, any organization or institution tells you that they won alone, they are lying to you. What 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 got Trump out of office was a black-led, multiracial, multi-sector united front. Um, and if there was ever a time where we needed one in the U.S., it is certainly it is certainly right now. And so I feel like the the movement for Black Lives in and of itself. Uh, is, is over 150 organizations and growing across this country. Uh, the, the rising majority, uh, which is building an anti-racist, pro-democracy left, uh, that is also so many organizations that are doing work across sector, um, across issue areas, across identity. Um, and, and now the front line is an electoral manifestation of that work that's being led by the Movement for Black Lives Electoral Justice Project. Shout out to EJP. Um, shout out to the folks that created it, Jessica Bird, Rukia Lamumba, and the illustrious Kayla Reed from Action St. Louis. Shout out to United We Dream Action, uh, also the folks that are helping lead this, this effort. Um, and again, I think what we learned is that we, we needed each other. Uh, we needed a party, we needed, we needed social movements, and we needed those folks to be working together at the intersection of our interests. Uh, to be able to overthrow fascist and, and authoritarian tendencies on the federal government. Uh, but I, I think the other piece of, of, of importance about our work is, is that it it's, wasn't just to get him out, right? Like Trump in and of himself is not going to end white nationalism in this country, is not going to stop anti-Black racism, is not going to overthrow capitalism, is not going to stop and end militarism. Um, and that neoliberalism is killing many of our folks and many of our communities uh, just as much as the Trump administration did. 
so I think one of the things that we created some popularity around with, again, with lots of other people was reminding folks that we weren't voting for saviors. We were voting for our next targets, even if those targets sometimes were people that we kind of liked, right? You know, like even if they were some folks on the local level or the state level uh, that were related to our movements, we were actually positioning ourselves to be intentional about knowing that the fight only continues and that we now is not the time to dismantle our big we, right? Now is the time to lean in even more with even more people power to make sure that we win the progressive policies that we want. I think, you know, to close it up, because I know we're going to have time to talk a little bit more about, about some of these lessons, is that what is very, very clear, and Justin talked a little bit about the demand that many of us raised in the streets across this country around defunding police. And what we've learned, because we live in the past, present, and future all at the same time, um, whether, you know, is, is, is actually knowing that this fight for electoral justice is not a new one for Black people, right? That this fight has been for as long as we fought for electoral justice and reconstruction or, or when the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was started or the BNC, the Black National Convention in 1972 or our reiteration of it in 2020. This, is a long, this has been a long haul fight. And so the things that we are demanding is the people are saying that we are asking for too much too quickly. This is actually a century, centuries long battle that black people have been, have been building um, toward to, to fight for electoral power. It's not the only kind of power that we want, but we recognize that it's a piece of the puzzle when our elders and ancestors said by any means necessary, they meant by all the means. Um, and so I think in this moment, we are recognizing that when we talk about multi-tactical strategies and interventions, we're talking about protests and policy and advocacy and electoral work and organizing and base building and not pitting those against each other, recognizing that even though some of us might play in different parts of those tactical expertise, now is the time to do it all and to do it together, because if we do it together, we will absolutely win. Thank you so much, Ash. Ali, similar question. So Masa's recent win against the U.S.-backed coup in Bolivia was a breathtaking defeat of also uh, of, of authoritarianism. So what are kind of what are what's the combination of electoral strategy and mass organizing that you're seeing from Bolivia and um, any lessons that you have for us? Hi, uh, thank you, first of all, to Haymarket Books and to all the other panelists and the team who are interpreting uh, with the sign language. Um, of course, I think this is a good time of year, the end of the year, to reflect on uh, what's gone wrong, what's gone right, and how build a left that can um, move beyond being a minority force and into actually winning victories. And I think something that's very important to do in that process is look into countries such as Bolivia where that process has been successful. And I think people around the world um, saw, I think, were, felt hugely inspired by the victory that Bolivian people had um, in at, at the end of October of this year, when after um, a year of living under an extremely authoritarian uh, tyranny, under an unelected government that was imposed not by the ballot box, but via a military coup, people were actually able to beat that back without, um, you know, without arms, but actually being able to do it at the ballot box. And I think there's two, you know, there's there's a number of lessons, you know, the Bolivian experience is not something that can be exported and imprinted in the United States or any other country, but there are principles that can be learned. The movement towards socialism, which is Evo Morales' party, which won the elections in October, was founded in the 90s at the struggle against the US military presence in the tropical of Cochabamba, uh, which is where our radio station is based. Um, and it was feel, it's founded on the principle that our movements, our social movements, should go beyond just a defensive struggle, should go beyond just protesting against bad things. It should actually move into a position of beating the powerful and actually governing ourselves, taking state power. And that was hugely important because throughout Bolivia's history, there's been incredibly powerful uh, 
um, organization at a community level, at social movement, workers' union level. However, with powerful uh, unions in and of itself, you can't nationalize your country's natural resources. You can't build schools and hospitals. You can't um, you know, nationalize the telecom industry just to be able to have signal, phone signal, internet signal to reach every corner of the country. You can't bring millions of people out of poverty purely by having strong um, social movement, community organization, um, organization. You have to actually be able to move beyond that and be able to take state power. That was an incredible, that was a founding principle of the party. And throughout this year, what we saw was an incredibly important marrying of the two principles of the social struggle and the electoral struggle going side by side. Because if the mass was a purely electoral organization, just uh, you know, a, a political party with nice politics and good ideas, it would have been wiped away last year when the coup, after the military coup, what happened? Leaders were arrested, people were taken away, tortured, people were thrown into exile, uh, people were, were being shot in the streets. There were two massacres just after the coup. So if that was the mass was just, you know, uh, an organization of a few prominent figures, it would have been wiped away when those people were wiped away. But it wasn't wiped away because the mass is not a traditional political party. And this is something I think movements around the world can learn from is that the mass didn't exist as a political party that individuals joined because they're good policies. The mass exists as a coalition of social movements. Of It began with the social movements in the Tropic of Cochabamba, but expanded to the whole country to have a physical presence in the whole country of movements affiliating on the principle that we need an instrument, not a party, but an instrument with which to enter politics on our own terms. To not have you know, someone come down and say that we'll represent you, but we'll represent ourselves with a political instrument to do so. So they went... How, if getting movements right across the country, you know, wildly diff people speaking different languages, different cultures, um, from the Andes to the Amazon, people that never met each other before, but affiliating on that basis. And of course, that's not an easy process and it's not a, a simple solution. There's 101 problems and contradictions that will always come up, differences of opinion, clashes. Just this week, I've seen. Um, Currently, the mass is in the process of electing its candidates for the local elections. And that's a hugely divisive issue. Every sort of section of the party, every different movement is trying to get their people into certain positions. And in some places, in Potosí just last week, that actually turned into a physical fight between two different factions. It's an incredibly uh, difficult process. But at the end of the day, despite all the problems and contradictions there are, it's an organization that has managed to stick together not because people feel uh, some sort of brand loyalty, but because, because they join not as an individual, but through their movement, they feel it's their own party. Even if there are disagreements, even if there are mistakes, it's their party. I am the party. In some ways, it's like a family. You know, family, there's all sorts of fallings out, problems with each other. But at the end of the day, you stick with it because it's something uh, larger than you and something that you are part of at a core level. So I think that those lessons are incredibly important for uh, those wanting to build movements that can win around the world. And I think it should be done on that principle, on the principle of winning. I think our movements can do better than just being permanently in a state of oppositional protest. The question is, how can you, um, is not how can we stop X, Y and Z bad thing. The question is, how can we build a new society? And you can only do that by taking state power exactly what that looks like of course will be different in every country but it does need to i think be on the principle that ordinary people need to have um not just a good party that represents them but actually to be able to govern themselves through taking power at a state level and the experience of bolivia shows that that can only be done that can only be done when you marry together the social movement the social struggle and the electoral struggle the social movement struggle by itself won't lead you to be able to brew, pull millions of people out of poverty and build a new society. But then the electoral struggle just by itself means that you'll be like one of a hundred political organizations throughout history. Maybe you'll come and go, 
you'll be uh, win an election or two and then disappear a year after. In Bolivia, there's a hundred left-wing socialist communist parties that have fared very well in various points of history, and then they disappear. They're passengers in history. But there's a difference between those who are passengers in history and those who remake history. And the movement towards socialism uh, with Evan Morales as the leadership has is you know is not a passenger in history. He is someone that provided the turning point for the country. Bolivia went from being the poorest country in the region into its fastest growing economy during uh, Evo's government. There was a year of interruption, a year of historical error, but that process has been taken once again. Once again, uh, Bolivian people are, are able to rule themselves. And I think, I hope people around the world can learn, can learn about that experience. Evo Morales himself is very keen for people around the world to learn from that experience. One of his first acts upon returning to Bolivia was to call a conference of social movements from across Latin America to build unity between peoples to refound the whole of the region on the basis of plurinationalism and anti-capitalism, anti-imperialism. So uh, thank you for giving me the space for, um, and, and I hope the lessons of Bolivia can, can inspire people and, and I hope people can, can learn the lessons as well. Thank you very much. There we go. Um, thank you so much. And one question that I want to ask you all that I think feel like was a theme throughout something you were all saying is this conversation around state power and building organization. I've been in a lot of um, social justice and like leftist spaces where there's kind of pretty heated debates around um, the role of electoral politics. Does it detract from revolutionary aims? Does it detract from liberatory aims? Does, is it propping up systems and a state that is, does not serve us? And a, a lot of um, challenges around that. So I'm just really curious to hear what y'all say to the critique that um, electoral organizing does not have a place in movement building or in revolutionary aims. There's been a lot particularly in the land around defund and abolition and all of these pieces that these things are inherently in opposition. And I'm, I'm wondering uh, what y'all would say to that. Anyone can start. I could jump in on this. I think it's, um, it, it's a defeatist attitude in some way because it's saying that the business of the state of who governs the country should be left to a certain class of people and we'll sort of concern ourselves with sort of X, Y, and Z issue, how important they may be. And I think that's a shame. I think it comes from uh, a history of, of defeat, of not seeing the possibilities of being able to build a new society, which is why I think it is important to look, uh, you know, to countries that have been able to build new societies. I think, you know, if you look to Bolivia, you know, you could say all of the same arguments. Bolivia before 2005 was a the infrastructure. The state was completely corrupt, was a com completely neoliberal, uh, colonial at its heart. But people managed to remake that. And that's, you know, it, there's nothing special about Bolivia, something that can be done around the world. And I think it's almost a liberal, very liberal, a very defeatist idea to withdraw from um the, the goal of taking state power, of being able to refound the whole country, not just your community and not just the issue that you care about. Um, you're limiting yourself to being a single issue campaign. I think that's, that's a great shame. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, as I said before, just by having strong movements, strong communities, you can achieve an, you can achieve an awful lot, but what you can't achieve is the big structural changes that um, you know, humanity needs around the world. Yeah, I totally agree, Ali. I mean, I also, I also think like if I was breaking it down for everyday people, right? That that one, I believe in in regular ass people's ability to self determine and self govern, 
point blank period, right? And so, so if I don't allow opportunity, if I'm not building the alternative that is to scale, to Ollie's point, that will get my people broadband internet service, that will make sure that my people have access to health care, that will make sure that all of the taxpayer dollars that they spend are not going to policing and to millerization and actually are going to, to, to help us build healthy and sustainable communities where everyone can thrive, then I'm actually conceding territory. And I think that the last four years, the last several decades, the last few generations are evidence of what happens when we don't fight for all of the things we deserve, not just what we've been taught that we should, that we should like focus on because it's only what we'll be able to win because it's what we're willing to concede to. When we concede this area of tactical intervention, other people will fill the vacuum. And when they do fill that vacuum, we will have to add the cleaning up of the messes, the electoral messes, the policy messes to our organizing priorities, right? So for, for me, it, it's, 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 I don't think that anybody could tell me that they are more revolutionary than Chokwe Lumumba, right? That I don't know that I believe that anyone can tell me in a 21st century context that they're more rad because they don't fight for electoral justice than Fannie Lou Hamer. I, I think folks would see, I think it's our job to make the absurdity of it, of it all obvious. I also though think to, to the, in very Gemini fashion, that the flip side of that argument, though, is that no one is no one is arguing, especially those of us that are that are truly studied and practiced leftists, that the state as is is what we want either. Right. We know that just getting one lefty person elected to a federal position is not going to overthrow the state. Right. But what we do know is that if we don't practice, we will never build up the kind of capacities that we need to be able to, to tear it up to tear it down, to uproot it so it can never live again, and to do the harm reduction work that can be possible through advocacy and policy work uh, when you have elected officials in, in the seat that are worth a damn. Um, and so I think that that is, that is our work. Um, I think there's much nuance to this discussion that is necessary because what's also real is if we're only talking about the federal elections in the U.S., we're also still conceding territory, right? What does it mean um, that, you know, in a state like mine in Tennessee, uh, sending you all mountain magic, um, that in the state of Tennessee, it's a winner take all state. So when I go and I tell people like your one vote counts, but they vote for a Democratic Party member or a Green Party member or anyone else that's not a Republican on the federal level, if, if they don't get it in, they, you know, if we don't win the majority, we don't get our vote actually really doesn't count. Right. So I think there's some. I think there's some some necessity now that we have survived Trump and and, and, and tried to to stop his second term, even though the slow coup is still happening. Uh, I think it's going to be really important that as abolitionists, we think about what are the state structures that are that are keeping us from being able to self-determine what democracy actually looks like when we get state power, to Ollie's point. Right. And I think that we've got to figure out, like, what are we going to do to popularize the demand to abolish the Electoral College, to abolish the Supreme Court, to abolish the things that would mean that my pop, my individual popular vote, my community's vote doesn't actually get to have a say, but the, the power of the white vote in places where there's not as much population density actually gets to determine elections. And I think that's the next wave of what electoral, like the fight for electoral justice is going to have to look like if we're actually going to win our, and be able to sustain our power. Yeah, I, I agree with with everything that, that Ali and Ash said. I think, um, you know, I guess a specific example of of, of defund work in, in in New York City. You know, I mean, I've seen. You know, you have most of I, I think the abolitionist uh, organization uh, happening is is kind of very hostile to state and any kind of organizing that engages the state. And, and to my mind, I, I understand that, I understand why, um, but a sober assessment of where we are at in terms of having the power to actually uh, defund the police, much less ab abolish the police, um, is you have to engage with it. I just, I don't, I don't, I don't think not engaging is, is an option, uh, particularly because, okay, one, you want to try and get the people who are going to make the decisions, make the decision in your favor. You want those people in that place. Um, so for us, 
we want city council members who are not going to pass a budget um, that's going to continue to give billions and billions of dollars to the NYPD. Um, but aside from that, I mean, real talk, most people's engagement with politics is, is by way of electoral politics. Um, it's unfortunate. Um, I, I, I'm under no illusions thinking that, you know, we're going to elect socialism, we're going to elect everybody's liberation, we're going to elect any kind of revolution, that's not going to happen. Um, but the way that I think you, 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 you're able to fuse uh, the electoral realm um, and the movement realm is you have to make it more possible for more people to engage in struggle. Um, and the way that I think most people understand politics is by way of these electoral fights. Um, but you have the opportunity in engaging in these electoral fights uh, to agitate, uh, to propagandize, to talk about what kind of power people can have um, and to broaden the horizons, make it beyond just like, OK, every two years or every four years, we're going to have this election. We've got to go all in to make sure this person gets elected. What happens after that? It's, it's, it's essential uh, that electeds, candidates and the movements backing them are engaging with people on that question about, OK, where is your power beside just, you know, checking a box for this person and how can we build that and increase it? Um, and I think it's essential that, you know, if we want to change the way policing works in this in, in this in this city, in this state, in this country um, or any other issue, we, we have to look at actually look at where power lies um, and power lies with people. And it lies in these in these institutions. And we have to put the people into these institutions and change them. Thank you all so much. Um, so I have like a technical, you know, organizers to organizer question, right? Electoral work means that you're touching a lot of people. You're engaging with a lot of folks. We're in the midst of a pandemic that makes that incredibly complicated. And like additionally, the, elect the economic crisis that so many people are in, like how did it shift? How does doing this work now shift how it's done? What are the lessons, like what are you, what do you people take forward now that we learned how to engage in kind of mass, like mass space building, mass work under the context where it is dangerous and, and challenging for so many communities to engage face to face? Um, yeah, what are the lessons and learnings in that process? I mean, I can I can speak for 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 DSA and New York City DSA. So, for example, we had a state legislative slate um, and a race that was you know ongoing, and then the pandemic hit. Um, and we pride ourselves in the organization on having a really strong ground game. We're in local politics. It's kind of usually these 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 local politics is often controlled by a political machine, at least in New York. Um, and that political machine kind of has things captured. Um, and they don't really necessarily have the biggest ground game, these, 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 these local machines. Um, the difference for us is we had a bunch of people, highly motivated members um, that were willing to just get out in mass into the streets, knocking on doors, talking to people. Um, the pandemic took that away from us. Um, so the best that we could do, I mean, I think we... We, we moved we moved to Zoom like everybody else. Um, we took our door knocking um, and moved it to uh, text banking and phone banking. Um, we did our best to make that text banking and phone banking a social experience in the same way that no door knocking was, you know, getting a bunch of people to go out and hit the streets and knock on doors. Um, it was difficult. It made things harder for us, but we were able to persevere and still, you know, win our races really decisively. Um, you know, I think it's one of the things that we've, we've, we've gone into a lot more recently is, 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 you know, what we would call relational organizing and trying to, you know, people having people do, you know, mapping their social networks. I'm not talking about Facebook, but mapping the people in your lives and around you, um, that you work with, that you live near, et cetera. Um, and, and getting into the habit of having, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations with these people about the issues that affect their lives and how, you know, 
how they can be changed if they take action, not just going and, and voting, as I said before, but like, you know, in getting involved in organization. Um, so I think for us, that's, that's, that's been a big part of it is, is trying to figure out how to talk to the people in our lives about this stuff and, and, and agitate and, and organize them into this work. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that 2020 was an opportunity for the rest of the country to really take some notes from rural and working class and Southern people, right, um, who have been organizing and building social solidarity uh, while also being physically distant for, for, for quite some time. Um, so I think that grassroots organizations did what grassroots organizations did. They talked to their members. They talked to their neighbors. They talked to their folks. Folks made concrete analysis of concrete conditions about the risks that they could take um, and figured out COVID safe ways to be able to actually be in, communi in community with each other. Um, I think that folks, I think the, the, the reality for 2020 and the electoral cycle that we just experienced and are experiencing, right? For some of us, it's not over. Shout out to the comrades that are probably missing this call because they're trying to get every single human in Georgia to go out and vote, right? Um, but I, I think what we learned is that, that, that folks will turn out when they have someone that speaks to their values and the things that they want to see come to fruition and has made a commitment to it, right? The Democrats are blaming defund for not winning seats when actually the reason they didn't win seats is because they didn't stand up for any damn thing, right? I think what we learned in 2020 is that there's no such thing as neutrality, <laughs> right? You're, you're, either built, you're either bending the moral arc of the universe towards justice or you aren't, right? You're either pushing it towards justice, transformation, liberation, or you're actively pulling it against it, whether you intended to or not, right? Your intentions are, are not what gets gets material change for me and my community, right? Um, and so I think what we're learning is that through all the technological means and quite frankly, some of the in-person means that, that were COVID safe, that were utilized to make sure that we were reaching every voter, I think the, the big thing that we need to remember is that, that our people are not stupid, right? They actually understand the nuances of the, the, the messiness of electoral politics, right? Many of them don't see themselves in the work at all. I think we spend so much time analyzing the electorate, but spend so little time, so little time acknowledging the millions of people that are unorganized and are not touched to be able to vote in the first place, right? So I think we need to have a reckoning on the left about like now that we've gotten beyond this like ultra leftist correction around like not fooling with elections at all, which which was a correction that needed to be made to stop particular other liberal uh, uh, interventions, right? But an overcorrection nonetheless. Now that we've balanced out some of that pendulum swing and we are now focused on building multi-tactical strategies, I think there's some real serious questions we have to ask ourselves about the, the assumptions that we're making about what people's best interests are without talking to those people. I say that as a rural person who many of you might say lives in Trump country when Trump was born in Queens, right? A place that has been devastatingly impacted by Reaganomics when Reagan was born in California, right? We gave you Stacey Abrams. We gave you Jimmy Carter, right? I, and I'm not saying that they're perfect. <laughs> I'm just saying in comparison, what the South has offered is a little different, right? And I think that we need to be having conversations about why folks vote and why they don't. And we need to be talking about how more folks can vote, right? Um, I think there's a, a question about how they vote and, and literally structurally, right? Like why aren't more of us able to vote uh, with ranked choice voting like everywhere else, right? Like why were there so many contradictions around mail-in ballots, right? Why was it easier in some places to do that than others? And I think there's structural things to figure out as we collectively come together across our differences to define what democracy looks like in practice. Uh, I think that is the work of, of the next few years. And I think that if we don't answer some of those questions going into the midterms, we're going to find ourselves in another situation where even though as goes the South, so goes the nation is a fact, not an opinion, that we're still trying to set up the infrastructure uh, for all of us to actually be able to actively participate in democracy, while the white right, the white supremacist right, actively does everything in its power to disenfranchise and disempower folks from being able to exercise their right. I am. Um, I think the issue of, of COVID, I think 
the issue of COVID-19, I think, is um, enormously challenging. I mean, in Bolivia, it's a very unique example specifically because the coronavirus pandemic was used by the unelected regime as an excuse to sort of keep people locked at home, stop social protests. And that's why they were so keen to uh, put an incredibly rigid lockdown early on. During the course of the campaign, what we saw was, in a way, people losing their fear, you could say. People certainly felt that uh, the imposition of lockdown was something that was imposed by a hostile state for political reasons. And people started coming out to rallies. People started losing that fear. And of course, coronavirus is, is, is incredibly uh, dangerous. And it's very important that we have uh, you know, COVID safe um, measures to you know, accompany political actions, etc. But I think it's also not, it's not conducive for, for the left. It's not conducive for those building liberatory movements to have the sort of overly alarmist attitude, to have people sort of locked at home, trembling with fear. That's not something I think that inspires confidence in people, not something that can inspire people to go out and build something that can win, that can, uh, on the basis of governing oneself. Because I think what all of us are talking about here is building an alternative that is not just, you know, uh, a progressive party or a left-wing party with good policies and standing on that basis. What we're actually proposing is something much deeper, um, an alternative based on refounding the state on the basis of uh, transforming the economy away from a neoliberal model. So all of these issues requires people, and pe- uh, people will only come out to vote for that if people feel confident enough, confident enough that ordinary people uh, have the capacity to govern. The politics shouldn't just be left to, you know, a few um, elite people that went to this or that university, but it's actually something that should be done with the participation of the majority of society. People have to have the confidence to do that. And I think is a uh, coronavirus and the issue of lockdown is presented in almost challenges for that. It's something that's kept people locked at home. Um, so we have to be able to find ways to balance, you know, course protecting ourselves and having uh, measures in place but at the same time to not have our people to not have you know our supporters to be you know sort of locked at home so, you know just watching breaking news on loops looking at all the terrible things building a sense of dread and a sense of fear i think that's a path to defeat um that's not a path to, to liberation so i think is is a debate i think that has to be had in every country according to their own conditions of course about how you can you can balance the two things. Thank you so much. We're starting to get some questions. We're starting to get some questions in from folks. And one thing I want to ask you all is like, what's next, right? So what is the next campaign struggle? Like what's on your horizon for the movements you're connected to in the next six months to a year? What are you starting to focus on? Yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of of critically important and sometimes really exciting power building work that's going to be a priority, not only for the movement for Black lives and the rising majority, but also for the front line. Um, You know, I think particularly for the front line, Uh, we were very clear that we weren't just going to get Trump out and then go rest on our laurels, right? We weren't going to just breathe a sigh of relief and, 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 and hang up our, our United front. Um, And so the next step for the United front is to continue to build power, uh, particularly so that we can go into inauguration day and the first hundred days of a new administration and a new Congress uh, with some concrete demands, right? Like we believe in the power of the People's Charter from the Working Families Party. Many of us on this call, uh, the organizations that we represent on this call influence that document. Um, We believe in the vision for Black Lives and very particularly in the demand around divestment from policing and investment in community solutions. So we will continue to be pushing the BREATHE Act as the 21st century civil rights bill of our time. Um, We believe in the Thrive Agenda, right? Like it is our time to have a people's bailout that doesn't leave anybody behind, right? We need some economic shift.
in this country. I think everybody that's tuned into this call would agree with, with at least those policy platforms amongst many, many, many others, right? And so we are, we are doing our due diligence to make sure that that synthesis of demands um, is what we're prepared to go in fighting for in regards to, to the first 100 days of the new administration. Um, I should be clear that, that there's, there's also like some real uh, real challenging moments that are that are going to be ahead, regardless of, of a Biden Harris administration. Right? We know that we are coming up on some mass evictions in this country if if the rent moratorium uh, does not get extended, right, and likely uh, might not, right, if we don't build power the demand that it do. Uh, and so what we're what we're prepared for is to be supportive of like right to the city and so many other incredible housing rights organizations that are making demands that people be able to stay in their homes when the only reason that they don't have the resources that they needed to stay in the first place was because of a failure from the state, right? I think we're we're like knowing that we're going into another year where the number of man-made climate disasters are not only going to increase in frequency, but they're going to increase in their devastating impact in, in, in communities like the Gulf South, right? So there's much to do around supporting folks that are developing the red, black, and green New Deal uh, to make sure that we're building a racial justice forward climate justice bill that that our people deserve, right? There's there's so much right now uh, that that is coming forward because of the United Front, where people are starting to build solidarity with each other across the silos that we've been in. That gives us an opportunity to really come correct uh, with our demands in ways that don't leave any of our people behind as we continue to fight for justice. And so. I think that's what's going to be next for the for the front line is making sure that we keep the united front going. I think in regards to the movement for black lives, y'all should tune in and see, right? Like we, you've already seen that we are relaunching the vision for black lives, the 2.0 version. More of it is coming in 2021, so be on the lookout. Uh, I'm sure you all have seen our covid demands and have seen uh, the the call for amnesty for protesters that that threw down and made the impossible possible in 2020. Um, and I'm sure you've seen that in the War on Black People section that we launched this year, more is coming in 2021. Um, and then, you know, we're going to be committed, as we've always been, to making sure that we're building local power, because building local power is how we get everything else. Um, and so we're continuing to be committed to the over 150 organizations in our ecosystem uh, to win their demands and to fight for, for defunding the police, amongst a million other things. Uh, we're excited about that. Um, and for the rising majority, we're going to keep on keeping on building this anti, uh, you know, racist uh, pro-democracy left. Uh, and we want folks to join it. You know, I think that's the, the, the most exciting thing to me about 2021 is being able to absorb the millions of people that we have activated in this country. Um, you know, anywhere from I've heard 25 million to 67 million folks have been in the streets since June. And I think this is our opportunity to do the mass political education that they are thirsty for, the training and cross-sectoral multi-tactical intervention that people are demanding, um, and then to give them movement and political homes to sustain them as we continue this long haul fight for justice. Um, I think that's what all three of our the, those particular parts of our ecosystem are going to be doing in 2021. Yeah, I think uh, all that all that Ash said was really great, and I think for 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 me and and you know in DSA, um, I'll, I'll speak locally and then I'll speak nationally. So in New York City, um, we're going to continue doing our defund work. Uh, our, our defund the NYPD PD campaign is a is a is a priority campaign for us um, because it's a movement demand linked to um, electoral politics and that we need city council members that are gonna get uh, elected, uh, hopefully join the budget committee and make sure that we have a budget, um, probably not in the next budget, but the, but the following one, uh, because that's when these council members that'll get elected in 21 will actually end up you know, in office. Um, getting us a budget that, that isn't gonna, is gonna actually do the hard thing and take money away from the police. Um, so that, but also alongside that, it's 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 doing a lot of political education around around abolition, around what is the alternative, you know, to to state violence, to violence work, basically, um, and and showing that because people have questions about that, and we should answer those questions for people. Um, 
Beyond that, you know, locally, we're also doing a, a tax the rich campaign, which is building on some of the work that we did in our state uh, races. Um, so we built all this electoral infrastructure to do our state legislative races. We don't want to just like put that away and turn it back on in a couple of years. We want to continue to use that. Um, so we're doing we're doing a door hanging campaign right now targeted at all the state representatives Um that have been kind of, you know, going along with Andrew Cuomo and refusing to to tax rich people, to tax millionaires and billionaires in New York, in New York State um, so that we can actually have revenue uh, so that we can do the things that we need to do for people in this state. Um, we got a ton of people that can afford to pay taxes. Let's make them pay taxes at a higher rate. Um, we're also doing health care, health care work. Uh, we're doing our eco-socialist work in New York City. We've got a public power campaign trying to get people to uh, trying to get publicly controlled uh, utilities, um, trying to get a statewide single payer plan. Um, but as it relates to national, you know, nationally, we've got, like I said earlier, you know, we've got we have elected a whole bunch of people uh, from municipal on up to Congress. Um, it's important that we build uh, the capacity to win races at a local level. So we build that bench, you know, when, you know, after Obama got elected, you know, much has been said about the, the democratic party lost, you know, nearly a thousand seats nationwide, you know, state, state, state houses on up. Um, we want to invest in building, uh, electoral power everywhere and not just these places that the democratic party has kind of seeded. Because uh, I think it's it's red country, you know, referring back to what I said earlier, you know, Trump might have won Florida, but a minimum wage of fifteen dollars also won in Florida. So what does that say? I think if you campaign uh, and organize on working class demands, you can be surprised by what might happen. Um, we've got our fight for our lives eco socialist campaign that's you know demanding green jobs. Uh, Pass the PRO Act, pass a federal jobs guarantee, uh, green stimulus. We're going to continue to fight for that because we know just because you might have still have a, a blue house um, remains to be seen what will happen in the Senate. And I'm hoping everything goes well in, in, in Georgia. But just because you might have, you know, blue representatives doesn't mean we're going to get what we need uh, for working people. Um, so. We're very much focused on making sure that we build the power to make sure that these people do what we need them to do. Um, so building an organization is really key. Hey, yeah. Um, of course, I'm not in the United States, but we're going to be facing a number of interesting questions going forward in Bolivia, questions that maybe those in the United States haven't had to face, but I think you should start to think about just in our own radio station, uh, of course, we have to think about how we can interact with the state. How can the state support us? How, where will we be uh, more independent? And of course, our radio stations affiliated to a social movement is owned by a social movement, which is the Six Federations, just the union that Evan Morales once led. Um, and those movements that are affiliated to the party that's now in power, having to ask very interesting questions: How? Um, what does building and maintaining a movement look like when we're in power, when we've got our leaders as senators and as ministers and government officials? What does that look like? How do we interact with the state? Do we take the, you know, if we have a problem, if there's an issue that we have that needs fixed, how do we go about fixing that? You know, um, of course, during the, during the past year, during a, living under an unelected and hostile government, the answer to that was to come out into the streets. But of course, all of those uh, questions are changed when one takes power. And I think people, uh, movements around the world should be thinking about these questions. Because why not? Why should, you know, movements consign themselves to being permanently in, in opposition, to permanently protesting against three or four important issues? Why shouldn't people think about what a post-neoliberal economy would look like? what you know a new refounded state would look like i think it's something actually that would inspire people and you know plants a flag which people can identify and unite around which different 
people from different cultures, different backgrounds, experiences can look to and, and engage with. And then it's, uh, it's incredibly important. I mean, the current president now, Luis Arce, he's an economist. And before he came into politics, he ran these sort of Marxist intellectual uh, study groups around economics, around how you build a post neoliberal economy. And that was hugely important for preparing uh, the party for power. Luis Arce himself isn't someone who comes from the social movements, but he came into the party on the basis of we. We are here at the service of the social movement. So we are the political instrument of the social movements. And I can bring something to the table. This is what I've been working on. This is how we believe we can build um, in concrete terms the kind of change that you have uh, discussed and talked about and built a political organization around. So how do we build those alliances? Um, and it's, it's an incredibly sort of liberating way to, to think about things, you know, to um think about what how would the world be when we change it um so yeah thanks for um, for the questions i think it's been an incredibly engaged in the discussion i want us to talk with y'all forever and i want to recognize that i don't even have time to squeeze in one last question to you all so i'm going to just really start with gratitude um First of all, um, Justin Charles, Ali Vargas, Ashley Henderson, y'all have been involved with incredible and impactful work, um, work that has defeated authoritarians, work that is building new visions, and work that's tackling the really challenging questions of what does people power mean? What can people power build? And um, what is a movement-focused way to build our way forward. I think that I'm so excited that we have a whole conference today to keep digging into these questions. And there is so much, there is just so much happening. And I remember as a younger organizer, I was always told, you know, organizing is not a spectator sport. So there is a piece around encouraging all of the participants today to deepen their work, to look up the work that all of y'all are doing, to figure out how that they can support and bolster what we're saying. We've talked about a lot of complexity today, about what is the role, like what is the role of movements in mass? And what are we building? And in some ways, starting to touch on what's our vision for liberatory governance? What's our vision for people being able to build the economies that they need and to get their needs met and to have and experience true safety. I think we do this with each other. We do this through organizing and we do this by tackling the really different questions, the really difficult questions. So thank you again for Center for Political Education. Thank you for Haymarket for having us. There's going to be a 30 minute break between this and the next session with Tarso Ramos and Rachel Herzing on assessing and beating the far right. I hope you all can check it out. That's going to start at 345. Thank you for having us and uh, thank you for having me.